ho, 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 ho. Yesterday's episode had Artridge discover a vital clue. Are you sure it's a vital clue, Ferg? Could be a red herring. Ah, it could be a red herring. You are correct. I'm Heather, he's Ferg. We are new old friends. And thank you for joining us for another chapter of Crimes, Clues and Christmas. Now, as we get a little closer to the big day, we want to give you a gift. And that gift is a banging podcast recommendation. Great segue from me. Well done, me. Thank you, me. (laughs) (laughs) Our very dear friend, Deron, will be launching a fantastic podcast in the new year. It is fascinating. Looking into all things to do with Nordic music and musicians. It's called Melody AM. Melody AM. And they have some absolutely brilliant guests lined up. Now, it's a scene, the Nordic music scene, that we didn't really know that much about. But it really rewards spending time getting to know. That is MelodyAM.com or at Melody AM Pod on Insta. Check it out! Yeah. Anyway, hashtag Nof Quiz Question 19. From which country do the delicious Christmas cakey biscuits called Liebkuchen originate? On with crimes, clues and Christmas. Dong dong. Crimes, Clues and Christmas. Chapter 19. Having heard O'Rowby pacing about the stage, shouting to himself, to no one and everyone all at the same time, I barreled out of Dot's office and into the auditorium, with Dot beetling along a few paces behind with her little legs. The inspector was pacing back and forth across the stage, muttering to himself under his breath. Ortridge, where have you been? He demanded. I've been in Dot's office where you left me, I replied. What's happened? I need a key, quickly. Here you go. I tossed him my office keys. What are these? He asked, taking a close look at the rather natty silver key fob I'd had made, which was embossed with P. Artridge Esquire, Art Investigator. My keys, I explained. I thought it would have been obvious from the fob, but perhaps the inspector wasn't as bright as I'd given him credit for. Why would you give me these? You asked for them? No, I didn't. Well, you asked for a key, and there are three to choose from there, I reasoned. Reasonably reasonably, really. What? I obviously need a specific key, not just any random key you happen to have on you, you flaming idiot. He flung the bunch back at me with quite some force. Had I not nimbly jumped to one side, they might have struck me and left a bruise. Or worse, embedded themselves into my skin, requiring keyhole surgery to extract them. All right, no need for name-calling, simple enough mistake to make. What key is it you need? The one for the cleaning cupboard in the dressing room corridor. Dot had stayed quiet throughout this exchange, but chose now to break her silence. I've got the key. I need it. Quickly, give it to me. I don't have it on me. It's in the office on a bunch with a bunch of others. I'll go get it. She clambered down from the stage and made her way back along the central aisle of the auditorium. Can't you hurry up? An inspector called. Well, the inspector. Inspector O'Rowby. And he shouted it more than called, if I'm honest. She's actually going as fast as she can, I commented looking at Dot pumping her arms as she chuffed along the aisle. As she went, she was breathing out small puffs of smoke from the various cigarettes burning about her person, so she looked a little like a miniature steam train chugging its way along the track. Why do you need to get into the cupboard anyway? I'm going to arrest Tatum Lyle and Marlena Schweinvolger for the murder of Daisy Love. Really? Absolutely. I'm not wasting any more time playing silly games with amateurs, he spat the word at me. I shouldn't have let them go with their flimsy alibi in the first place. But the candle wax proves this was a premeditated act. The method strongly suggests Tatum Lyle, and, despite what Marlena claims, she was furious about Daisy usurping her. The note to Rawlins proves it. I still don't quite follow why you need the key to the cupboard, though. They've locked themselves in there and aren't answering. They aren't answering? No. Did you see them go in? No. Can you hear them talking? No. So you didn't see them go in, you can't open the door and they aren't making any noise. That's accurate. Then, and forgive me for asking, how do you know they're in there? O'Rowby smiled and tapped the side of his nose. Oh, come on. You may as well tell me, Inspector. I am telling you, Artridge. I can smell them. Or rather, I can smell the honeysuckle cigarettes Miss Schweinbolger smokes. They're hiding in there, but I've got him now. I can wrap this case up and take Christmas off to be with my family. O'Rowby hadn't previously mentioned any family, and I was going to inquire about them, find out if there were any O'Row babies crawling around, you know, try and patch up the unpleasantness from earlier. But Dot appeared puffing her way back through the seating, holding a jangling set of keys aloft. 
Got him! She rasped triumphantly and threw the entire bunch onto the stage where they landed with a loud clunk. To scoop them up and hotfoot it to the cupboard door was with O'Rowby the work of a moment, myself in close attendance. Mrs Clitheroe languished some feet behind. He banged on the still locked door, but his pounding provoked no response. Right, this is your last chance. Come out now and it'll play better in court. I know you're in there. I too could smell the sweet aroma of honeysuckle mixed with the tang of tobacco and agreed with his assessment. Although, I suppose it's possible that the unlikely couple had enjoyed a tryst in their favourite spot before making good their getaway, leaving a lingering whiff of post-coital smoke. O'Rowby began working through the collection of keys, one after the other. Which one is it? He snapped, irritably. Is one of them, replied Dot, with admirable equanimity, given the way she was being spoken to. It's silver, I'm pretty sure. Or bronze. They're all silver or bronze, whined O'Rowby. Surely one of them must have taken gold? I quipped, but instantly regretted it, given the dark look I was shot. Aha! exclaimed the inspector, when at his fourth or fifth attempt he found a key turn with an audible thunk. He threw open the door, and inside, sure enough, was Marlena Schweinvolger and Tatum Lyle, twisted around one another like Gustav Klimt's Liebespaar. But unlike that painting, so full of life, the two figures in the closet were devoid of all animation. Their skins had lost the luster and warmth of the living, both now a pallid grey colour, and their limbs hung lifelessly around each other. Kiki's face was turned away from us and collapsed down into Marlena's shoulder, but hers was staring out directly at the door. Her eyes, so cool and composed in life, were vacant and haunting. Her lips, still painted bright red, were smiling and now seemed vulgar and out of place, like when a child blithely changes medium and adds two strokes of acrylic paint to a drawing hitherto composed in crayon. They looked as though one would be able to pluck them off, to harvest them like, like a tropical fruit from a hideous plant of death. Oh dear God, whispered Dot, her eyes locked in a staring match with Marlena's she was certain to lose. For the first time since I'd met her, she didn't have a cigarette anywhere on her person. She simply stood, gazing at the horrible image before her. They're both dead, aren't they? I'm afraid so, Dot. Oh dear God, I'll go call for an ambulance. It is going to keep us closed even longer. No, too soon, sorry. That was mean-spirited of me. You can tell me later. An hour seems reasonable. Go and make the call, Dot, if you would. She nodded and disappeared back to her office. Well, that explains why they weren't answering me at least. O'Rowby leaned in and picked up two cigarette ends from the floor and held them under his nose. (laughs) Sniff that, Artridge, and tell me what you can smell. Don't inhale too deeply, though. I took one of the stubs from him and gingerly put it under my nose. (laughs) Honeysuckle? Well, they're definitely Marlena's, I said and offered the piece of evidence back to the inspector, but he pushed my hand back toward me. Go again. Beneath the honeysuckle, there's something else. You'll be fine. Again, I inhaled, a little deeper this time. And yes, O'Rowby was right. There, underneath the floral fragrance, was a different scent, something savoury, nutty. It's almonds, definitely almonds. I can get a bit of almond underneath. Are you thinking somebody poisoned Marlena's cigarettes with cyanide, Inspector? I'll have to get one of the boffins at the station to run some tests to be sure, but it all lines up. The smell, the smile. Pretty obvious, I would say. Cowards! But who would do this? Marlena gets her cigarettes made up for her bespoke. We'll need to track down her tobacconist and ask them some questions. Or I suppose somebody could have found out where she stores them and made the switch. What are you talking about, Hartridge? Asked O'Rowby, with a look of genuine bewilderment across his face. Have you really not seen what's happened here? Um, I can see two more deaths, Inspector, but this incident is clearly targeted. We're definitely looking at murder now, I'd say. Jesus, it's obvious, man. The pair conspired to kill Daisy Love, giving each other an alibi, which had the added benefit of being true, by the way. And they thought they'd got away with it. When we pinched live, they could see the writing was on the wall, and he played us, well, you, perfectly, and spun a tale just about believable enough to get them both out of Chokey. But she left her passport. Well, sure she did, because they knew at that point there were no border controls where they were going, lad. They could see the noose tightening, and they decided going out together on their own terms was better than letting justice be served. So they came here, made like animals, and lit up laced cigarettes. You're saying they killed themselves? I've no doubt in my mind, Artridge. Jesus. What O'Rowby was saying made sense, but I wasn't fully convinced. 
I'd been swayed by the arguments Marlena and Katie had made, not just about their furtive fumbling, but about the motive, or, or lack of one, they'd have had for hurting Daisy. I also didn't really think that sneaking around an elaborate plot was particularly Marlena's style. I could just about picture Daisy being mown down in a hail of bullets fired from the vengeful guns of a Bonnie and Clyde-style Cakey and Marlena, but the subtlety of the method seemed too slow, too impersonal for me. Besides, there was still the fact that the sandbag had simply been rigged to fall centre stage. The killer couldn't have known exactly when the candle would have burned all the way through the rope, and therefore couldn't have been sure who, if anyone, it would land on. Sure, it was in such a position and at a time of day that there was a pretty good chance of it impacting someone, but by no means could you predict with any precision it would be Daisy. Unless perhaps Barrington had been in on it, and had been tasked with keeping the new Prima in position for long enough for the bag to fall. Hmm... That felt pretty unlikely, and would mean another loose end which didn't fit with O'Rowby's neat theory of homicidal lovers. Finally, there was cyanide as a means of suicide. If one is set on taking one's own life, there are other options available to you. Cyanide may be quick, but it's far from painless. Also, why would they bother to conceal it in their cigarettes? What would be the point of that? If they had access to the lethal drug, it would be much simpler and quicker to take it as a pill or in liquid form. Perhaps you could wash it down with some strong liquor. I don't know. Despite the pleasant aroma of garden flowers, something still smelled fishy to me. I tried to say some of this to O'Rowby, but he was having none of it. No, Artridge, I'm sorry. I humoured you long enough. But now it's time for real police work to take over. We have all the necessary ingredients here for a murder-suicide plot, and I have to say that looking for logic in the minds of murderers isn't necessarily a wise choice. These are sick people. The very act of taking another's life in cold blood bloody shows they don't think the same way about mortality or morality as you or I. The case is over. I'm done. Merry Christmas. And that, as far as Inspector O'Rowby was concerned, was that. More hospital orderlies arrived to clear the bodies away, and he told Dot that she was allowed to reopen the theatre the following night for performances, if she so chose which she still grumbled about because Barrington would need more time to find and rehearse in the new Prima. I tried to bring a little levity to the situation by suggesting Dot throw her own name into the ring. Don't be daft, Mr. Artridge. I couldn't do it. She pulled on a pair of cigarettes. Could I? You don't think I should, do you? Oh, well, maybe it's worth asking Mr. Barrington. He's, he's the expert, after all, I blustered, suddenly feeling very bad that I'd given this funny old lady false hope. I couldn't find Chaz in the theatre before I left and realised that without the case continuing, I was going to have to try and come up with alternative reasons to hang around the building. As it turned out, I wouldn't have to wait long before fate brought me back. Crimes, Clues and Christmas is a New Old Friends production part of the Comedy Who Done It's For Your Ears podcast series. Written and performed by Fergus Woods Dolph and Heather Westwell with sound and music by Fred Riding. New Old Friends gratefully acknowledge the support of Arts Council England in making Comedy Who Done It's For Your Ears. Thank you.